As for many of you here, Pramea is new. We have a small video that will tell you about our organization. We'll just proceed with the, today's session. Uh, as you have seen in the video, Pramaya was started in 2016 and we have uh, catered to the needs of almost 5,000 patients so far. We run a flagship cancer support program called the Sahai Cancer Support Program. We have about 1,000 people already participating in that along with their families. We have uh, 15 experienced healthcare professionals on board of various specialties in oncology. And also those people share the vision of uh, Pramea Health, which is preventive and supportive care and building healthy communities. So we also provide support for tackling a lot of non-communicable diseases. That is, uh, you know, heart diseases, cancer, diabetes, obesity, mental health, and um, also some respiratory problems. We have sessions in yoga, meditation, mental health and nutrition to support these services. So uh, just a short introduction of uh, me and Dr. Manasa here. I'm a breast surgeon with uh, more than 32 years of experience as a clinician. And uh, I am passionate about preventive health care and supportive care. So that's how we started this organization called Pramaya. Dr. Manasa Bhatt is an MD in Ayurvedic medicine. She's a competent professional. She's also very much interested in promoting holistic health. So Pramaya actually works by integrating uh, different streams of medical care to, in order to provide better health services to patients. So today's 
topic is while many of you may imagine that it's to do about uh, you know skin care hair care and looking good in older life uh, what we would like to uh, emphasize is all that is very important but uh, beyond just the external experience there is something that we need to do to ourselves to age well in order to enjoy life to the fullest and realize our uh, maximum potential so we'll begin with a short quiz so i would you take them through this please yeah just to make it more interactive uh, when it's not like uh, you have to be a right you can answer this so the first you can write the answer in the chat box so when do you think uh, you start uh, getting old or the aging process begin like uh, losing muscle mass or getting uh, wrinkles on your skin so as per you when does the aging start okay start typing it's nice to see everyone so interactive so majority of you are saying 40s 50s some 30s and some said when we are going when we think we are getting old yeah so we have a rough idea let's move on to the next question so when is the general age at menopause occurs when is the general age at which menopause occurs Forty, ma'am. You can type in the chat box. Yeah, this one. Everyone is very clear about this. Okay. <laughs> the age of forty. Okay. Yeah. So, do you think you experience only physical symptoms during menopause? Is it only the physical symptoms that trouble during menopause? okay thank you for your responses we are not disclosing the answer here because throughout this session we will be walking you through the answer and with much more information so let's move on uh, although you know you will uh, get the answers as you listen to us when do you begin to age is something everybody is interested in right so i just want to show you how muscle mass is lost muscle mass is the beginning of so on the right hand side you see a picture of three people of a family three generations you see the daughter the mother and the grandmother uh you can see how the grandmother has shrunk on the left hand side of the slide you see the aging process so at between 10 and 20 how somebody is upright i don't know why this my power is misbehaving i'll just use the this this mode for now you see the lady between 10 and 20 upright 30 and 40 upright but as she is approaching 50 you can see this slump then there is more progress loss and then completely shrunk by the age of 60 so between 20 and 30 the process already begins muscle mass is decreasing unless we do something about it it's not possible for us to retain that youthfulness physically right so this is i'm talking about the physical uh, aspect of aging so this is something that we must know when do you start aging biologically physically the aging process starts between 20 and 30 now why are we talking about all this today let me try this so as we know the populations are getting older so uh, about 22% of the people in the world 
will be over the age of 60 by the year 2050. You can see the different regions that is, uh, you know, North America, Canada, all this part of China, etc. 30% or more will be 60 years or older. And India is this 10 to about 30%, maybe about 25% of our population will also be uh, much older, 60 years or much older by the time we are, uh, we approach 2050. So this shows that, you know, the aging population is going to become a sizable group in the years to come. So this is the changing map from 2015, you can see on the left to 2050, what is happening. Overall, life expectancy is going up, people are living longer. So the uh, life expectancy of a baby born today is supposed to be about 71 years. So when we were born about 60 years ago, it was just about 40 years. The average life expectancy I'm saying. There are people who live much longer, but that's a minority. So now people are expected to live much longer. So average age life expectancy is about 71 years. So you can add easily add a 20 year thing in this. So when we have that much time, longer life, what, what does it mean to us? It gives us a lot. Oh, We've got an extra 20 years that we can spend. Then how do we want to spend it? We could continue working. We could educate ourselves, do some, learn something new. We can lead a very productive life. Our, we could, you know, take care of our families, probably our grandchildren, et cetera, at that age. I'm talking about uh, above 60. But all this depends on how healthy we are, isn't it? So there's no point in being uh, disabled and bedridden or with chronic aches and pains and, you know, having people take care of us when we can take care of them. So if you see, when you talk about aging, like many of you have put in the chat earlier on, it's the biological age has nothing to do with the chronological age. We know there's no typical older person. People who are 80 can have the physique and the mentality of a 20 year old. Whereas you can see a 40 year old, almost like an 80 year old, very dis disabled and unable to contribute much. So health, when you think of health in an older person, it's not random. Why is it, are we seeing that some people are, um, you know, really good when it comes to health they are able to sit upright, stand upright, walk distances, climb mountains at 70 plus, whereas some who are just 40 are unable to achieve much. What makes us age differently? Of course, it's the genes. A lot of it has to do with the genes. Who we are, you know, basically what we feel about ourselves and how we uh, project ourselves mentally. Our health behaviors. What are the choices that we make? Our environment, where we live, you know, what are we subjected to in terms of pollution, what kind of water we have, what kind of food we get, and of course, our access to healthcare. Having said our access to healthcare, we see some of the healthiest people in the world in very remote areas, the Hunza Valley, for instance, or some island off the coast of Greek, for in Greece, for instance. So it's not uh, completely dependent on healthcare. So although we say, you know, doctors are few in number, hospitals are few, you could find very, very healthy people in remote areas. So there is something else that is there about aging and health. So just take a look at this picture, right? Look at all these problems, fatigue after meals, aches and pains, abdominal fat, uh, high cholesterol, thyroid problems, hormone imbalance, constant hunger, cravings, polycystic ovarian syndrome, all of those. Could this be you? There's something at the bottom of all this, which is called the insulin resistance. So what we need to understand here is that our body is a physical reflection of the choices that we make over a lifetime. It is not something that you've done last week or something that you've done last month. It's over a lifetime. So that's an important point for all of us to understand. And we need to gain a new level of awareness of what is going on in our body. Only then 
we can make this change. So today we are going to try to understand what the hormonal change of menopause, which is a very common thing uh, many of us face, uh, how that can affect us. So unfortunately, today's environment, we are bombarded with a lot of uh, wrong things, harmful things. We all know that uh, our the female body is subjected to a lot of hormonal fluctuations during our lifetime, right from puberty till menopause, a lot of changes keep happening, right? So through puberty, the girls grow, uh, secondary sexual characters develop, and uh, then the, in the reproductive years, uh, pregnancy, childbirth, lactation, then a lot of problems related to perimenopausal status and then menopause. So estrogen is a hormone that has a very, very impactful effect on uh, the female uh, body. Unfortunately for us in today's world, we are in contact with a lot of uh, chemicals called xenoestrogens, which are estrogen-like compounds that are found in everything around us, unavoidable. That's the scariest part, right? So what does the xenoestrogen do? It, so in this picture, you can see the receptor and the estrogen binds to that and then it tells the, uh, it sends a message to the cell and asks the cell to behave in whatever particular way the cell has to behave with respect to the hormone secretion. Now, the zero estrogen, which mimics the estrogen, it's not estrogen, that also binds to the same receptor and it gives a signal, which is not meant to be. A signal which is not <clears throat> supposed to happen <clears throat> at that particular time of the cycle. So what about, so that the cell again secretes hormones, which is it's not supposed to secrete at that time. So unnecessarily we are bombarded with all these hormone signals within our body. Now, where are these xenoestrogens? Where do we find them? All bleached products, the cling film and the plastics that we so uh, we are so fond of, dairy products, because uh, that's a whole big story to itself. Cows are injected with hormones in order to provide a continuous supply of milk. So you have xenoestrogens and additional estrogens there all the hormonal medications that people take over a lifetime, you know, uh, menstrual regulation tablets, oral contraceptive pills, then hormone replacement therapy, uh, all of this taken for a long time is dangerous. For a short time, prescribed by your doctor for a particular condition is all right, but taken over a long time is not good. We also find these chemicals in soil, water, air, food, because food itself, we don't get healthy food these days. Packaging, cans, etc. In the workplace, chemicals, pesticides, fungicides, and all our household items, even the, the soaps that we use, the cleaning agents, all of them can have these harmful chemicals. These are called endocrine disrupting chemicals. So BPA, phthalates. So it's very important for us the labels of the things that we buy to make sure that these polychlorinated uh, biphenyls, dioxins, pesticides, uh, triclosan, all of these at some time or the other we've seen, right? Even most of our shampoos, personal care products, all of them contain phthalates. So right away, you know, if you use it today, you may not see the damage tomorrow. If you use it for a long period of time continuously, you are likely to see problems. So we're constantly doing the hormone balancing act. And what I told you earlier is the choice is ours. So we have, we are born with certain genes. We can't change that. We live in an environment to some extent we can change, but again, we don't have too much of a control there about the air we breathe, what we eat and drink. But there are certain things that we can do, some good choices that we can make to stay healthy or some bad choices that we make to, which causes disease. And the bottom line is nutrition, physical activity, and decreased levels of stress are what contribute to our health and aging. 
So uh, again, uh, we have a few facts for you to just uh, think about and uh, give it a thought and maybe answer. So do you think bleeding after an year of menopause is common? Is it a good thing? You can uh, type your answer in the chat box. Yeah, majority of you are getting it correct. Uh, it is not a good sign. Post menopause, like after complete cessation, there should not be a bleeding. Next, uh, do you feel the weight gain that generally happens in the perimenopausal season? I mean, perimenopause time or just before menopause, is it inevitable? The weight gain during uh, menopause is really not inevitable. It can totally be controlled. And were you aware that there is a World Menopause Day? Like Father's Day, Mother's Day and Children's Day, there is even a World Menopause Day. There's a day for everything now. Yeah. <laughs> can you, can you, uh, oh, you didn't know. Can anyone guess when is World Menopause Day? Uh, no, it's not in June. It's on October 18th. And uh, nowadays, even many of the office, they are thinking to have a menopause champion because many women, they are uh, suffering a lot with the symptoms of menopause. It's celebrated on 18th of October every year. And a uh, few factors like smoking, surgery, and cancer, these can accelerate menopause. And any clue, uh, what is the word that is used for menopause in Japan? And uh, particularly we, have asked, we are asking for Japan because it is a special place where, you know, like uh, people don't feel troubled by menopause like the other part of the world. The word for menopause in Japan is konen ki. So they actually consider it a time of renewal during midlife years. So they say it brings a sense of purpose and growth. And it's not a time to feel sad or depressed. And it's time to embrace the future possibilities. So they look at it as a growing period. So you would actually see a lot of very uh, old people. Uh, Japan has a, a very old uh, population in terms of uh, aging population is very high there. And they are all very, very productive, uh, very participatory even as uh, as old as 90 plus. So uh, they don't even have the connotation of menopause as it's seen in uh, other countries. So a lot of you had said menopause occurs around 40, 50, et cetera. A lot of it depends on your family history, at what age your mother or your sisters attain menopause. It is not something which happens over time. These are changes, like I said, which you start aging by the age of uh, between 25 to 30, you start the process and the hormonal changes keep fluctuating when the hormone levels go down. So it's not a, uh, an overnight affair. With some people, it can begin as early as 40 and go on. Generally, when you stop bleeding for one year, that's when we say you have attained menopause. So until then, you know, it is perimenopause, say from whatever time that you start uh, experiencing some changes in your body. So there could be changes with respect to your hair and skin because the estrogen levels fall, your hair growth slows the hair. Actually, you can notice the texture of the hair changing. It becomes thinner. The skin loses elasticity. Your bones actually gradually become more and more fragile because your bone mass decreases, you can actually feel yourself shrinking or becoming shorter. 
the breast fat increases. Uh, you know, the breasts are very dense before that. So actually during screening, we recommend people who have attained menopause, closer to menopause to have a mammogram instead of a uh, breast ultrasound. Because there's a reduction in the glandular tissue, there are some changes in the breast. It becomes much softer, sags more, etc. The risk of heart disease increases. So most women have a 10 year period where they can, they have a 10 year benefit compared to the men. Their hearts are stronger and start of the in your period that's because estrogen is protective for the cardiovascular system when the estrogen levels come down there are changes in the cholesterol levels etc and heart diseases the incidence is the same as men so of course during peri perimenopause you have erratic periods uh, if they are an ovulatory cycles that means the ovaries do not produce eggs etc the vaginal wall becomes very thin. It, you, you may have uh, burning in the urine. You may have uh, itching in that area. You may have fungal infections, etc. because the mucosa changes. Also a very common finding and what people uh, hesitate to talk about is urinary incontinence. You may find that as you grow older, when you cough, there's a little bit of leakage or maybe when you laugh a lot, there's a little leakage of urine. There could be painful urination or frequent urinary tract infections. So these are the things that can happen around this time. A lot of uh, people have uh, also answered in the chat box that menopause is associated with emotional changes and not just physical changes. Very true, there's a lot of anxiety, distress, uh, you know, uh, uh, crying spells, emotional outbursts, upheavals, etc., which can happen during menopause, sleeplessness, etc. And of course, post-menopause, all the aches of the joints, pains, osteoporosis, and like I said, stress incontinence and UTI. So these are, these uh, definitely impact, have a psychological impact, physical impact. And in a survey, it was found that 82% of women experience some kind of symptoms during menopause. Very few actually sail through it without much uh, uh, problems. Maybe it's because they're too busy to uh, worry about it or, uh, you know, their psyche is completely different. But uh, what, what do they value most? They want to feel good. They want to be in charge of those symptoms. They want to feel in control. They want to look good. Everybody wants to look good around that age, right? And uh, they want to have a lot of family support and care, good relationships. Because all these three things, feeling good, looking good, and nurturing friends and family, having a good family support, friend support, really improves the quality of life of people. So just some scientific factors on aging. Uh, the DNA in our cells has something called a telomere. So that is the end of the chromosome. As you can see, the red portion of the chromosome, it's like a shoelace. You know, if you've seen a shoelace, you have a cap at the tip of the shoelace, it's like that. So these telomeres, as, we, as the cells keep dividing and becoming older and older and older, the telomeres shorten. So finally, the cell uh, becomes old and dies. So if the telomeres can, by some process, be kept long, then aging process is supposed to be delayed. So there are risk factors which increase over time. Just the fact that every year we are growing older, chronologically itself increases our risk of aging. Oxidative stress, like exposure to the sun, exposure to chemicals, uh, pollutants in the atmosphere, etc., can damage our DNA, the proteins and lipids. Sugar, what we eat, there is uh, advanced glycation products. So those are the ones which bind and stop our DNA and proteins and lipids from, uh, you know, functioning well. So how do we stall this aging, aging process? Of course, we all know physical activity, healthy diet, emotional and spiritual health, good relationships. All of that is important for us to stay healthy through the long years that we are supposed to live. It is a given 
there is no negotiation of certain things that we have to do in order to look good, basically, and stay healthy. Skin care must begin early because by the age of 25, uh, you know, our skin starts wrinkling, darkening, drying up, etc. Posture, physical fitness, with the practice of yoga, I mean, from our culture, that has originated from our culture. A lot of people have restarted that. It's wonderful. Flexible, maintain a good posture. Very important for us to attend to health issues. Most of the time, women around the perimenopause age uh, have multiple responsibilities of taking care of the family, career, etc. So the health of the woman is always put on the back burner. So we must focus on building bone strength, muscle mass, preventing arthritis, and especially the pelvic floor. Like I said, that's where the muscles become weak, inside our pelvis. We don't even see it. We don't even know those muscles exist. We need to exercise those, work on that. If we don't want to, end up with problems of incontinence and prolapse, etc. later on in life. So all this we must begin not at age 40 or 50 when we are going through perimenopause. We need to begin this much earlier. So we keep telling people at least by 30 you start all of this. If you haven't started, it's never too late. You can always start. It. And of course, screening. I'm a cancer surgeon. I'm a breast surgeon. So screening is very important. I cannot uh, you know, uh, emphasize more. Breast, gynecological cancers, non-communicable diseases like heart disease, diabetes, mm, hypertension, all of that, and thyroid problems. All these things happen in the perimenopausal uh, period and it kind of creeps in. Before you know it, it kind of stares you in the face. So it's very important to get ourselves screened regularly during this time. And socializing is an important, very important part of aging well, staying healthy. Lots of research has been done on this. And it's extremely important for our emotional and physical health. So now, uh, as I told you, Pramaya likes to integrate different systems of medicine. Let's hear from Dr. Manasa. From an Ayurvedic perspective, she can enlighten us on um, how we deal with these issues. Over to you, Manasa. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, right from the age of Bhagavad Gita, the, uh, the process of birth and death, they are the inevitable, death is inevitable, Jatasya Maranam Dhruva. So this is the process which can't stop and the aging will keep on happening. So basically in Ayurveda, there is a three categorization for the age. One is Bala. That is the childhood and the madhyavastha, the youth. Uh, typically, after the reproductive age ends, that is at 50 or 60 postmenopause, then that is the vridhapya. So these are the three age main categories that we find in Ayurveda. There is no typical word called menopause, but post 60 is where uh, the dhatukshaya means all the bone mass, the muscle mass, whatever, uh, as uh, ma'am explained already, the posture uh, posture itself, I mean, it is shrunk. So those changes that will happen post 60 years. So second thing is, uh, usually this is supposed to be seen after 70 or 80 years, but nowadays we can see it a little early. Untimely aging is quite common and it has increased too much nowadays. What are the causes for this untimely causing as well? I mean, untimely aging for causes for untimely aging in Ayurveda is one is we all love those salty namkeens and extra salt in our food, right? That is the major cause uh, for your skin wrinkles, graying of hairs, and even uh, losing a lot of hair and stress. Women, uh, we always juggle between our career, home, uh, even if we forget about career, sit at home, we tend to get stressed for everything. Uh, someone didn't eat their breakfast uh, today, so we are stressed. So our relatives are turning up, we are not able to cook, so we are stressed. The maid is not turning up at time, we are stressed. Someone is not doing well, we are stressed. That doesn't go on to change the thing, right? So stress will only give you a lot of issues, but nothing good. And nowadays, this processed food, over-processed food, like we don't know what 
is our own food and what is uh, the food which has come from other places or that is chemically processed we really don't know what are the chemicals are added into it we just want things to happen so quickly that let's make it and eat it and forget about it we are not analyzing what we are eating so all these things they are causing for for the untimely aging next so many of you are talking that your sleep is disturbed and uh, you have skin issues so ayurveda generally talks of a triad it's a ahara nidra and brahmacharya and in today's uh, scenario we would say ahara nidra and vyayama see the food what we eat has a impact on our sleep the quality of sleep has impact directly on our health food has impact on health the exercise if we do a good amount of exercise like 30 minutes in a day at least 20 minutes in a day that will keep your hormone up you will feel better you will feel good and that will fetch you good sleep so it's a triangle it's a triad these three pillars they always balance your health so you have to be very careful about what you eat how much you sleep and a routine exercise in your day to day life yeah. next so overall the quest for healthy aging or you know like to be healthy uh, is there in mankind from very long so that's why we have the concept of rasayana and the concept of dinacharya in ayurveda aging is called jara like it is treated as a disease only because you know uh, it is a disease when you are disabled if you are healthy and having a longer life then nobody is worried nor you are unhappy but if we are not healthy then there is no point of having those extra added years in our life right so uh, of us know chavan prash it was um, many of you might be knowing the story of uh, that rishi chavana like he wanted to look young that's why that formulation chavan prash which was made up of uh, amlaki or the indian gooseberry that was formulated whatever the medications you want to take to look young it has to start early and the dinacharya like we have a, a set of rules to be followed in a day like what time to get up what time to sleep what to eat and what not to eat because what we are is what we eat the food plays a major role even while cooking you know uh, we have three concepts called ahara vihara and vichara food that we choose has uh, different qualities like you know uh, the each food has more of sattva few food has more of rajas and few food has more of tamas so they attribute to our mental faculties and also to the physical faculties and vichara the thoughts whatever we think that come becomes practical you know while cooking many of us we are so frustrated like we will be blaming someone or we will be angry and we'll chopping the uh, we'll be chopping the some vegetables and cooking and we'll be serving it so imagine you are transferring so much of negative thoughts and what about the energy that is taken by yourself and your family so they will bring a lot of changes inside the body and vihara like okay uh, many of us we walk on a treadmill or we go on a regular walk for 20 minutes but how uh, we are lost we are on call with someone talking about uh, some issue that happened or trouble to you we don't even know who is walking next to us right like we don't tend to smile we are, even in the 20 minutes of exercise we are so lost that we are not focusing on ourselves there are simple concepts in dinacharya like the oil bath as said skin care it has to begin from early we when a baby is born in home i i believe in almost all cultures we do that oil massage to baby without fail and we stop it at the age of 1 year or 2 years but it is not meant to be stopped you begin on day 1 or day 10 when the baby health is fine to start the oil massage it has to be continued till we can do it that will give you a flawless skin that is the answer uh, if you don't want to have a dark circle or uh, uh, a bad skin or uh, you don't want to have a acne prone skin do the abhyanga daily the one which you do for the babies it should not stop at the age of 1 it should continue and a minimum amount of exercise depending on your choice you can choose whatever and yoga and pranayama they are the best one to combat your uh, 
uh, hot flashes and the mood swings and the irritation that trouble you uh, during uh, the menopause and thoughts this is the cricket say i mean divert it have have some good hobbies divert your mind because you know idle mind is a devil's workshop even if you have some other work uh, but still if you are stressing on uh, some unwanted thing that will definitely have bad impact on you two things when you are over excited you cannot sleep at the same time when you are too worried you cannot you cannot sleep so try to balance your mind try to take a lot of deep breaths having a controlled breathing will help you to overcome your thoughts and once you can overcome your thoughts definitely you can follow uh, have a good sleep next so uh, thank you manasa that was uh, quite a detailed description of what ayurveda can offer <coughs> come to the matter of screening so there are certain uh, things that uh, manasa spoke about like dinacharya which is there even in our uh, system of medicine in the sense there are certain things we say choose the make the right choices of the food that you eat the exercise and keep yourself stress free free and today there are lots of things that are offered for you to pick and choose whatever suits you best there's no one size fits all and uh, it is not mandatory that everybody does a certain thing according to a particular strict protocol uh, what is more important in this age group of perimenopause and menopause is screening for certain problems like i said the body goes through so many hormonal changes so we need to understand the effect that we it has on different organ systems in our body most important is breast cancer we won't be dealing with detail in this session today we'll have separate sessions for each of that because there's so much more to understand there so for the breast health you need to start screening as early as 20 years when i say screening it's simple self breast examination so understanding your risk factors knowing your family history will help you determine whether you're at high risk or not discuss it with your family physician and you can start some form of screening process either either a breast ultrasound or a mammography depending on what age you are this has to be done on a regular basis so uh, self breast examination by you regularly if you are having your periods do it on the 5th or the 6th day of the period if you stopped menstruating if you are in the post menopausal group or if you have irregular periods pick a day in the month maybe the first of the month or the last sunday of the month or whatever mark it on your calendar and do it now all of us have smartphones you can actually uh, put a reminder in the phone to say examine your breast and then go and get a clinical breast examination once a year pap smear the for cervical cancer to look at the health of your cervix that is also a very important thing uh, the reason i put breast and pap smear on top is because breast cancer is the most commonest cancer in our country today but uh, 10 years ago it was cervical cancer but now breast cancer has overtaken it uh, the reasons for it are many uh, we will discuss it in another session but it's important for you to examine your breast regularly you must get a pap smear done at least once in your lifetime is what people say because if it is normal then you can rest assured for at least another 5 years but uh, if uh, there is some abnormality it's good to have it treated and corrected early detection amounts to cure the third most important thing is oral health oral health is related to so many problems in our body do you know that if you have gum disease it can affect your heart so you know a lot of cardiac problems start in the mouth so it's important that we visit our dentist regularly keep our mouth clean make sure we don't have build up of tartar etc take care of uh, teeth which are um, which have cavities caries etc and uh, examine our oral cavity every day in the mirror you could have a small ulcer there which needs some medical intervention there could be some patches on your tongue etc uh, if there is a new development you need to be aware of it all these things are within your vision 
right? The breast, the oral health, etc. Then gut health. A lot of people go through uh, gut problems during perimenopause. That is, they say, you know, the, there is bloating, there is gaseousness, there is constipation, there is acidity. Don't ignore it. You can try certain homemade remedies for a while, but if something lasts more than three weeks, for instance, please seek medical advice. And of course, mental health. In our country now, uh, thanks to so many celebrities coming out in the open, mental health is no longer a taboo. So you can speak freely about it. And uh, it has really impacted a lot of people, especially in the last two years. And through menopause, many women experience a lot of issues which need to be spoken about. You cannot bottle it up inside you because it has other repercussions. And all of this will be dealt with in separate sessions, but if you have any questions related to those, we'd be happy to answer. So Manasa, would you like to? Yeah. So healthy aging is, it's not an investment or, I mean, it's an investment, it's not a cost. Like, I think many of you will be familiar with few phases over here, like Hema Malini, Kiran Bedi, Sudhamurti of Karnataka. Uh, I believe, uh, you know, this lady, right? Uh, the uh, lady performing yoga. Any idea? Uh, many of you might have seen her videos. Uh, she is uh, Nana Mal, uh, like now she's not there, but uh, she did yoga till her age of 95 years. Look at her, like she, this is this documentary was done when she was 92 years old. She has such a flexible body. So anything can come with practice. We believe at 40, we become so rigid. We feel that uh, we have lost that flexibility, right? And uh, uh, juggling with the responsibilities, we tend to give up our passion. Like I think many would be into dance and other activities in their younger age and while going on, they forget that they even used to dance. So this is the lady uh, whose video went viral because she performed so well on the video, giving all expression for her old uh, Bollywood music. And uh, you don't have to be a business entrepreneur or anything, uh, she is a, a Harpachan Kaur. She is a lady who started her own uh, Basin Ladu business at the age of 94 and she has a lot of uh, good business running. She started at 94. It's not like she's running at 94, she started at 94. And our own pride, uh, now she is uh, 109 years old. Still, she is planting trees and she attends many afforestation programs and she is so active and so happy. So that's, that, that's what practice gives you. And uh, next to Talu Maradha Timaka is uh, Tata Mal. She is a, a retired uh, primary school teacher. Post her retirement, she followed her passion. She invested all her post-retirement amount and she has converted an eight-acre barren land into a beautiful forest. It's like the life that you want to, provided you take good care of your health. Health has to be given priority beyond everything. Thank you. So small changes can work. Economic group or uh, had uh, all opportunities that many of us have, but still they managed to lead very meaningful, successful, productive lives. It's important today uh, from Pramea, it's our request that each one takes a personal pledge to make any small change today and continue that. It could be switching to a plant, primarily a plant-based diet. I'm not saying you have to be a vegetarian, but including a lot of plant-based things in your diet, to eat mindfully and stop when you're 80% full. As a civilization, all of us are eating too much these days. Naturally, what we call non-exercise thermogenesis. It's not that you have to go to a gym or yoga class uh, all the time. Even otherwise, we can move naturally because climb stairs, or you know, walk somewhere to buy some things. We will burn calories without thinking. And 
like I said before, let's find time to meet friends and eat together. Because eating together, apparently, again, a lot of research has been found and it's evidence-based that it actually improves your sense of well-being. So we can start creating a happier, healthier life today. Our healthy choices become easy choices. So we have to find stress relieving strategies and uh, surround ourselves with positive people, not worry about uh, RT-PCRs and everybody testing for COVID positive these days. This too will pass. It is in the process of passing. So this is our request to you. Please make a pledge that you will continue to do. And uh, we have, sorry, we have uh, certain programs, the women's wellness programs. Uh, we will be sharing the flyers with you all today. Uh, you can call the numbers that are available on the, the flyer and get in touch with us for any of the problems that we have enumerated today that you may be facing, that you may want to consult and uh, find some solution for it. Like I said, we are an integrative uh, holistic programs which help you tackle these solutions. So you may find something that is of use to you. Uh, many are curious about the Japanese diet, why they don't have the menopausal symptoms. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the Japanese, they also eat rice. They eat very little. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Japan. I have, and I've seen 90-year-olds uh, actually walking briskly on the uh, street, you know, carrying their own handbags. Sometimes the handbags are too heavy for them. They're frail. So they have handbags with like a strolly. They pull it along on the road. And uh, they eat small quantities of uh, uh, rice, uh, fish, and uh, soy. So that's, uh, those are things that probably help them. So they live long, they don't have many diseases. Uh, until recently, you know, the stomach cancers, uh, though the cancer incidence was not very high in Japan, stomach cancers were one of the common cancers seen there. But now I think their cooking methods, etc., they have changed and that, is, that incidence has come down. The incidence of breast cancer in Japan just to, uh, a matter of interest is, and uh, Japanese who went to settle down in America, it's, it's just across the Pacific Ocean, right? The, um, uh, the uh, coastline of Japan, the Eastern coastline of Japan is just across the Pacific Ocean to uh, North America. So a lot of people actually migrated to North America. So when we were doing a lot of research on um, breast cancer in North America, they found Japanese had a very low incidence of breast cancer. This was two generations ago when they had just moved from Japan because they continued to eat their kind of food. Then with westernization, the incidence of cancer in the Japanese, breast cancer in the Japanese also started matching the Western population. So it is all to do with the food that we eat and the life that we choose. Any other questions? Uh, specific nutrition for women. What is the specific nutrition for women? Nothing really specific. Estrogen uh, uh, fluctuations can happen around menopause. So it's important that we are not deficient in anything. And uh, around menopause, Food with phytoestrogens like uh, flax seeds, apricots, uh, you know, many of these um, soy products. We shouldn't overdo on anything. In moderation is very good for us because those help us to manage hot flashes, the irritability, etc. Because phytoestrogens are plant estrogens, which are very useful during menopause. So there is nothing that we should uh, overdo. Moderation is the key. Otherwise, it's a very balanced diet. Also, calcium. Somebody has asked about calcium. Yeah. Taking calcium regularly, is it mandatory? Yeah. So, um, again, interestingly, so these are things which uh, people won't talk about. Interestingly, there were studies done 
on uh, postmenopausal women who are drinking loads of milk uh, and uh, fractures. So they found, and those who are not drinking milk, and they found that the number of fractures in people drinking milk was much more than those who are not drinking milk. So milk is not such a great source of calcium after all, is what we think. So supplementing calcium depends on the food you eat. There's a lot of uh, plant food, uh, dairy products like cheese, buttermilk, curd, etc., which are also rich in calcium. And uh, spinach, uh, sesame seeds, very rich in calcium. In fact, sesame seeds have nine times more calcium than a glass of milk. But obviously, I think uh, probably Manasa can throw some light on it. We can't have a lot of sesame seeds in a day, right? Maybe a few Yeah, it, it can be used in moderation. Use sesame seeds in chutney or the sambar, uh, whatever you make. You can have it uh, like quarter spoon and add it to your food. So that will, I mean, many say if I eat sesame seed, I get a lot of body heat. I end up in mouth ulcers, etc. So if you use it along with the food, a little to your chutney, a little to the sambar or any of the dishes you are cooking, that will not have the unwanted effect and that will give you a good amount of calcium. Yeah. How often should we do screening and uh, do we need to do regularly mammography? Yeah. So like I said, screening for breast cancer must begin from the age of 20. Unfortunately, in India, now we are seeing uh, breast cancer occurring almost a decade before it happens in the West. So if the number of patients with breast cancer are more at age 50 in America and Europe, we are seeing people at the age of 40. So it's important that we are aware of our risk factors. That is, do you have a family history of breast cancer, mother or sister, very close family history of breast cancer, who's anyway having the BRCA gene, you know, breast cancer gene. If those things increase the risk. Uh, also, the lifestyle has changed, the culture has changed, women are getting married much later. And uh, some are having their children after the age of 35, or many are not having the children at all. So if you don't go through a pregnancy and lactation early, your breast does not mature. The breast maturity is complete only when you breastfeed a child. So if it is an immature cell in the breast, it's more likely to uh, develop cancer. So putting off childbirth for a very long time is not a great idea. Third thing is having the right kind, wrong kind of food. Obesity is a great risk factor for both breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, and uh, colon as well. So we have to make sure that we are physically active and are not obese because body fat itself stores a lot of estrogen. So that's why obesity is a risk factor. The more uh, uh, fitter you are, the more you exercise, you are able to manage the uh, hormone fluctuations. Uh, so screening must begin, like I said, by age 20. You must have a breast self-examination every month. You must do it so that there are many other lumps in the breast which also need medical attention. Need not be cancer. 80% of breast lumps are not cancer. It's only the remaining 20% that we are worried about. So we need to uh, practice that. And uh, from the age of 30, you please see a clinician and get a physical breast examination done, clinical breast examination done. The clinician will advise you based on your risk factors whether you need to have a breast ultrasound. Mammography before menopause is not very informative because your breasts are very dense. You know, it's still subject to the hormone changes. So it doesn't give you the right amount of information. Nowadays, the ultrasound is very good. We have good sonologists, good machines which can pick up everything. And uh, sometimes when in doubt, they may even ask you for an MRI of the breast. So after the age of 40, every year you must get yourself screened for breast cancer. And uh, pap smear uh, uh, frequency for breast cancer survivor. Yeah, so if you're a breast cancer survivor, the pap smear uh, frequency does not change really. You need to have, especially if you are on certain hormone, <coughs> hormone therapy for breast cancer, then you need to get your uh, abdominal pelvic ultrasound. You need to look at the lining of your uterus if it is still there. Because some of the medicines can cause thickening of the lining of the uterus and uh, secondary cancer. So you need to 
get yourself screened regularly, maybe even once in six months, depending on how thick the lining is. But the pap smear, you need to do it once. If it is normal, your doctor may ask you to come after three years. If it is um, abnormal, you may have to repeat it more frequently, say maybe after six months or three months as advised by your gynecologist. Um, are protein shakes to be included? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are, while uh, your diet must have 20% protein in it, it's up to you to decide how much protein you're using. So try to use as much natural sources of protein as possible. And also, uh, Manza will probably uh, corroborate that. It depends on your body type. How much of protein can your body tolerate and how much does it need? So it all has to happen from a, um, a trial and error or an experimental uh, basis by yourself. But the guideline says 20% protein. Uh, your, your diet should con uh, consist of 20% protein, 60% uh, carbohydrate, 20% protein, 20% fat. Of course, if you've just undergone surgery or you know, you're exercising a lot or competitive sports, etc., you may need more protein, which again will go as per your requirement. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Lalita Priya has also suggested ragi and other pulses, which are very good source of calcium. Okay, very good. Uh, and uh, one person wants to know, do we need to get pap smear even after hysterectomy? So uh, in um, hysterectomy, they'll do what, after hysterectomy, depends on what kind of hysterectomy you've had. If you had a total hysterectomy and uh, salpingophorectomy, there is usually no need for a pap smear. But you may have to have a few uh, examinations of the vault, that is the uh, the portion of the hysterectomy scar inside the vagina. And if that is healthy, you need not have to keep repeating the pap smear. Hello, doctor. Uh, I have a question on this mental issues. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, uh, women are unaware of uh, when the mental issues start because uh, you know, it is all related to so many factors contributing to family and things like that. So, so many things like uh, tolerance and patience and so many things. But mm -hmm. somewhere down the line, they lose themselves and they end up uh, spoiling their health and uh, ending up, uh, you know, with a lot of fear, anxiety and all that around. By the time they come to 45, 50 with a lot of health issues. So... How do you suggest, uh, like, you know, how a woman should, uh, I think this awareness should be brought about to every woman, how to handle their life properly as we progress, other than uh, uh, the regular uh, health checkups, because uh, this is one thing that is unseen and uh, which does uh, cause a lot of health issues later on, you know, like a chain reaction, it sets off to so many other things. So throw light on the, those things yeah so uh, very uh, nice that you brought this up because uh, through perimenopause actually uh, not even that in fact nowadays because of the stress because so many people uh, if you look at our culture typically women stayed at home women took care of the family women cooked meals and uh, there was some order that was followed which is probably wise, but I'm not saying, you know, we go back to that time. All of us have jobs, we go out, we work, times have changed and we need to change with the times. But there is certain things that, lines that we may, must draw for ourselves. So depending again upon our nature. So you could be a very calm person, you could multitask. Uh, and what we cannot do, we must speak up and say, that it's not possible, we must ask for help. So those kind of uh, solutions we need to find ourselves. So nowadays we have counselors for everything, we can talk it through because the family structure has also changed. It's from a joint family, it's moved to a nuclear family. So very little uh, scope for elders giving us advice. So I think we have to think through this. It's not like, you know, we have a straightforward solution that we can just throw out. 
we have to think through this process of what is causing this emotional upsets, what is causing uh, so much of uh, stress and tension in our lives. How do we deal with it? Can we cope? Are we doing too much? Are we uh, you know, biting off more than we can chew? So these things are questions that we must ask ourselves. And uh, with the advent of um, uh, you know, the internet and uh, YouTube guidance, etc., there is a lot of good and bad. We have to find solutions even, you know, because we have so many teachers on the YouTube, so many talks that we can listen to, so many motivational things that we can listen to. We've got to find time and make an effort to find these solutions ourselves. Of course, like organizations like ours in Pramaya, we have a lot of uh, counselors, uh, experts, doctors who will be able to uh, guide you, some of you who have major problems that you find difficult to handle it yourself. 